Today we'll be focusing on preparation for IELTS and with me is our IELTS expert, Don. Now Don has a wealth of knowledge in everything IELTS. Um, so I'm really excited, Don, that you're here joining us today to walk us through all the preparation tools that IELTS can offer our test takers. Um, what do you have in store for us today, Don? Oh, Vincent, it, it would take too long to even start to describe it, but uh, it'll all be revealed in a moment. <laughs> Excellent. I can't wait. All right, let's start then. Now, Vincent, as you said, we're going to talk about our tools for preparing for IELTS from the start to the finish. And I will repeat a few things that you probably already know about the form of the test. I'll tell you about each part of the test and I'll talk about how you are scored. But the main focus is looking at our preparation tools. And there are many of them, as I said before. So we'll talk about that at length. Before I start talking about the test, let me tell you why we are so enthusiastic about IELTS. IELTS is the number one test of English, and that is because it is trusted. It is accepted. And it's not just accepted by uh, educational institutions. It's accepted for many, many purposes, many organisations, many governments. Universities, of course, not just in Australia or the UK, but in Canada, in Germany, all parts of Europe, South Africa, the United States, and many other countries. So it's a test that gives you a score that you can use just about anywhere and for anything. When you are preparing for this IELTS test, you need to do a few important things. You need to find out from the university, from the government department, from the professional organisation, what score you need and which test you should do. It might be that you need an academic test. It might be that you need a band six or a band seven. It might be that you need a higher band for reading than you do for listening. Find out those things. We can't tell you that. You need to go to the organisation and understand the test, understand the form of the test. That means looking at practice tests, and I'll show you where to find those in a minute. And it means preparing. Now, some people think preparing for a test is to do a, a hundred practice tests. That's wrong. Three or four practice tests are probably enough to understand the test. The best preparation is to improve your level of English. And then book a test date. Let's look at the test now in a little bit of detail. There are two versions of IELTS, academic and general training. And they are similar, but different in some important ways. In the writing, you have to do two tasks in academic and two tasks in general training, but the tasks are a little bit different. We'll talk about them. In the reading, you have 60 minutes and 40 questions, but the reading texts are a little bit different. For the listening, it's exactly the same for academic and general training, and also for speaking it's exactly the same for academic and general training. It's a big test. It takes nearly three hours to do an IELTS test. So be ready for that. Okay. There are two types of delivery. There are two versions, academic and general training. But for both of those, you can either use a computer or you can use a pencil and paper. This means that there's a lot of flexibility in how you do the test. You might be very familiar with using a computer, 
or you may be much happier using a pencil and paper. It doesn't matter. You have a choice. There are some advantages in using the computer. Using the computer means that you get your results more quickly. It means that you can do the test on virtually any day of the week, not just a Saturday. And the test will be a little bit quicker because we don't have to hand out papers and collect papers and things like that. But the content of the test is exactly the same. It has the same questions. It has the same length of time to answer those questions. The question types are the same. The way the test is marked is the same. The security around the test, having to prove who you are with your passport, is exactly the same. And as I said, the speaking test is exactly the same for computer and for paper and pencil. The IELTS test is recognised and respected throughout the world and one of the reasons is that everybody knows what a band six is. Everybody knows what a band seven is. Go to any university, go to any government immigration department, and they will know if you say, I'm a band six, or I'm a band seven, or eight, or nine. There are nine steps in an IELTS assessment. In fact, there are twice that many because you can have 3.5, 4.5, 5.5. But the basic steps are these. Band one, no English. Band two, just a little bit. Band three, a little bit more. Band four, you are beginning to understand familiar uses of English. Everyone listening today is probably higher than a band four. You are probably a band five, a six, seven, eight, or even nine. That means you are understanding most, if not all, of what I am saying. I am speaking a little bit more slowly than normally to help you, but if you are a band six, you are competent. That means you can use the language. You can use simple language. You can use more complex language. You make mistakes, but we understand what you're trying to say. We understand what you're trying to write, despite your mistakes. A band seven or eight or nine makes far fewer mistakes and is more sophisticated in their English. Let's look at the different parts of the test now. Let's look at reading to begin with. Now, the reading test is a, a difficult test in many ways. There are a lot of words. There are about two and a half thousand words to look at, to read in a reading test. But the topics in an academic reading test are not difficult topics. They are the sorts of topics that intelligent, educated people talk about. It might be about education. It might be about popular science. It might be about social trends or something like that. You have 40 questions. You have three reading passages to look at, and you have 60 minutes to do it. Now, remember, when I said two and a half thousand words, we don't actually have to read every word in a reading test. If you practice skimming and scanning and reading more quickly for meaning, then you might be able to just read about a couple of thousand words or less. The general training reading, as I said, is a little bit different. You might have six shorter passages. Section three will be very similar to the academic section three because it will be a longer text. 
but the other texts will be shorter. A list of rules, for example, or a group of advertisements, something like that. If you are living in an English speaking country and you go to your letterbox, you will find something from your local supermarket, maybe, or from someone who wants to paint your house. This is general training reading. So read that. Okay, that is the reading. Now, remember when I said you need to practice skimming and scanning to try and read more quickly? to try and read more efficiently? Well, this is what you should practice. Practice, not reading every word, but reading the important words, skimming, verbs, now. Not reading every line, but concentrating on the first paragraph, the last paragraph, the first sentence in each paragraph. Scanning, looking for key words to find the answer to a word in a question. And sometimes do read for detail. There are the tasks that you need to improve on to become an efficient reader. But it will help to understand that in IELTS reading, there are about six or five or six different types of questions. And each of those types of questions will test your reading ability in a different way. Some English language tests rely on this first one, multiple choice. Is it A, B, C, or D? And you can guess A or B. We have some of those questions in IELTS, but we have other ones too. Is this statement true or false, or is it not given? Matching. How do you match this information with that person or this heading with that paragraph? Completion. How do you finish this sentence? How do you finish this summary with a word? Or short answer questions. When did this happen? Answer, it happened in 2003. Do you see that some of these questions have a little star next to them? an asterisk. This is important information. Listen. If it's a multiple choice, if it's an identifying question, if it is a sentence completion question or a short answer question, the answers will come in the passage in the same order as the questions come on the question paper. That means if you find the answer to question 21, you know that the answer to question 22 will come after that. And the answer to question 23 will come after that. This is good information because it helps you understand or navigate or find a path through a reading passage. Okay, they're the types of questions you get in the reading. What about the writing? Well, the writing, as I said, is different for academic compared to general training in task one. The academic writing in task one is basically asking you to describe some information in 20 minutes and 150 words. This information will be in a graph, maybe a chart, a table of figures, it could be a diagram, it could be a couple of maps. So anytime you're reading something and you see a graph, look at it carefully and ask yourself, what are the key features of this graph? In other words, what is the main message in this graph? What is the main message? in this table of figures? What is the overall idea in this diagram? That is good practice for academic task one. In task two, you have to write 250 words giving your opinion. And you should be reading opinions, 
You should be reading serious English language newspapers and magazines. People writing about the problems of education, the problems of drug addiction, the problems of crime, living in the city, the problems with the health system. These are the sorts of questions you might have to answer, not just in writing, but also in your speaking test. So look at those issues, think about those issues, and have an opinion about those issues. Okay? Remember, you can use British spelling, C O L O U R, color, or an American spelling. C-O-L-O-R, both okay. Why? It's the International English Language Testing System. Okay, that's academic writing. General training writing, or oh, sorry, before we get to general training writing, this is an example of a task one. Remember I said that a task one is sometimes describing a diagram. Well, here, this diagram is a sort of flowchart describing how something is done. Now, in this sort of task, you are given a lot of words. Here, digger, metal grid, sand and water, wire cutter, bricks, drying oven, kiln, cooling chamber, packaging, delivery. We're very kind in IELTS. We're giving you a lot of words. But if you want to get your band seven or eight or nine, think about how you might change these words a little bit. Instead of saying for delivery, see the last picture? Say the bricks are delivered. Instead of saying packaging is the next step, say the bricks are packaged. These sorts of changes show the examiner that you have a flexible use of English. So show them that. The academic task two, as I said before, is a matter of giving an opinion. And the way you are asked to give this opinion is always the same. You are given a statement first. Here the statement is fairly simple. University graduates earn more, so they should pay for study. Then you are asked to respond. And here, the response is fairly simple. Do you agree or not? You can answer this question quite simply. I agree. For these reasons, perfect answer. If you want to get a band nine, you should also say, of course, other people disagree for these reasons. However, I agree because my reasons are better. A general training task two is very much the same as this, but general training task one is somewhat different. The general training task one is where you have to write a letter, 150 words and 20 minutes. You are given a situation and then you have to respond to that situation in a letter. You are told who to write to. You are told what you need to cover in your letter, the points that you need to include in, in your letter. The sort of question that you might be asked in a general training task one is like this one. You're given a situation. Here, you have heard about plans to build new apartments in a park. You are told who to write to. Write a letter to the editor of a newspaper. You are told what to say. Here, three things. Explain how you learnt about the plans. Say what you think of the park and give your opinion of the plans. You are told how to begin your letter. Dear sir or madam, this means the letter is a formal letter. You are writing to someone you do not know. That means you should be formal, not familiar. You don't say, 
hi, how are you? You say, I am writing to express my view. This is formal language. If you miss one of those points, those three bullet points, you will only get a four for one of the assessment criteria. So be careful that you follow, that you fulfill the task completely. A general training task two, as I said, is similar to an academic task two, less academic, that's all. You're given a statement, you are asked to respond to the statement and give reasons for your opinion. Looking at this one, you can see that this is a little bit more complicated than the first one, because here you have to give not just an, whether you agree or disagree, but you have to give the causes of a problem and the solutions of a problem. And in fact, the problem itself is complicated. It's about eating and it's about exercise. So really you have to do four things in this essay. Do three things and you will be penalized. Four things, exercise, eating, causes, solutions. Okay, that is the writing. The speaking is a great part of IELTS because it is a real communication between two human beings who are trying their best to improve the communication. The examiner wants you to succeed. The examiner wants to help you succeed. You want to succeed, so everything is Everyone is happy if you do, okay? The, the speaking will occur maybe before the written test or after the written test, but it will always be about 14 minutes. There are always three parts to the test. The first part is fairly simple, about you. What do you like? What don't you like? What do you do? Part two, is where you have to speak for two minutes about a simple topic, about someone you know, about somewhere you've been, about an event, about an object. And part three is more complicated. It's because it's where you are discussing a serious issue with the examiner similar to what you would do in a task to writing. What is your opinion about education, for example? Okay, it's important to understand that there are clear assessment criteria for both speaking and writing. And this is an advantage of IELTS because in some tests, it's not really clear what you are being assessed on and when. In IELTS, you are being assessed on four separate criteria in the writing. You are being assessed on four separate criteria in the speaking. We'll only look at the speaking today, but if you want to look at the assessment criteria for both speaking and writing, go to our website, IELTS Essentials, and you'll find them there. The first assessment criterion is fluency. That means, can you continue to talk without pausing, hesitating, repeating? Are you able to use words to connect your ideas together? On the other hand, however, I believe, as a matter of fact, let me think, these sorts of words add cohesion to what you're saying. In other words, they make your sentences stick together and be understandable to the listener. The second criterion is lexical resource, the words that you use. Now, a good speaker of English will use simple words and more complicated words when required. 
Simple words are good. I like cheese, right? But to be able to say, I like cheese, in fact, I like dairy produce in general, shows that I have some complexity in my language. Show the examiner that. The third criterion is grammatical range and accuracy. Accuracy, we understand. Ah and the, correctly. Prepositions, at, in, on, after, correctly used. Tenses, I go, I will go, I have gone, I will be going, I will have gone. We understand that. We don't have to worry about punctuation or anything in speaking, of course, because speaking doesn't worry about it. If you have a problem with some of those grammatical elements, fix them up. But the other thing you need to fix up is having a range of um, grammatical structures. Simple grammar is good, but you need to also show some more complicated grammar. Things like if sentences. If the government did that, then the problem would be solved. Nice sentence. And finally, you are assessed on your pronunciation. Can you pronounce the sounds of English? A, e, i, o, u, sh, s, b, p, t, k, all of those. But also, are you able to produce the music of English? That means, can you use intonation? Listen to me. I am using intonation to express meaning. Meaning is the word that I wanted to stress there, right? So I paused. I said, using pronunciation to express, pause, meaning. I have given you some extra information through my pronunciation, and you have to practice that. If you want to get a band seven, eight, or nine for pronunciation. Okay, finally, listening. Listening is difficult sometimes because you only hear the recording one time. That means you must concentrate from the beginning to the very end. If you lose concentration, that's a big problem. So practice concentrating for 30 minutes on spoken English. Use podcasts. Use video. Talk to your friends in English. The listening will always have four parts to it. There are 10 questions in each part. That's 40 questions. The first part is fairly simple. Two people talking about an everyday situation, maybe talking about going to have coffee or something. The second section of the listening test is where one person is giving some information. Maybe they're telling a tourist about things that they can go to in a city. The third part of the test is always two or three or more people in an educational setting. Maybe they're talking about an essay or a class project that they have to do. And finally, in the fourth and probably the most difficult part of the listening, you have to listen to a person giving a lecture. Someone like me talking about an interesting topic for a little while. Remember, in the pencil and paper test, you have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the mark sheet. But in the computer test, you only have two minutes to check your work. Okay, now let's get on to preparing. I've already given you some advice about preparing. 
I've told you to practice some things when you read. I've suggested you practice a few things for writing. I've suggested podcasts for your listening. Here are some tools that we have that can also help you prepare for your test. When you prepare for your test, doing practice tests is a good idea. But you don't have to do a lot of practice tests. We will provide you with free practice tests at our website. It will help you get familiar with the format of the test. And you'll be able to review your answers with by looking at model answers for the writing and the speaking. You'll be able to see if your timing is correct. In other words, do the test in one hour. Don't do it in, in 90 minutes, the writing test. You'll be, get some experience with the sorts of topics and the question types. But can I suggest this? <clears throat> when you do a test, do the test and then leave it and then do it again. The same test. Ask yourself, how can I improve? How can I become more efficient in answering these questions? Where do I look for the answers in the reading passage? What have I missed in the writing that I could include that would make it better? Why did I lose my concentration in this part of the listening test? Think about ways you can improve by re repetition, by repeating the test, and then even repeat it again and look at just one part and think, how can I use these words in my own writing or in my own speaking? There is a great um, online uh, tutorial from Macquarie University in Sydney. Uh, that helps you prepare for IELTS. I've used it myself and I can tell you it's very thorough. And you're able to use this as a free offering um, when you book your test. And it covers everything in the test, but you can choose to concentrate on writing or choose to concentrate on reading, etc. Another thing that will help you figure out at what level you are at the moment is the IELTS progress check. It's not an official um, IELTS test, so you can't use the score for university, but it is marked by official markers who will give you an idea of your likely score in four parts of the test. You'll get your score within five days and you'll receive an official and detailed feedback report. You can do this for academic and also for general training. So check that out. It's much cheaper than a real test, and it will tell you if you are near the score that you want to get in the real test before you book a, te a, a real test. The other thing that we want to tell you about today is that we have drawn all of our preparation tools together in IELTS Prepare. And you can access this at ielts.idp.com slash prepare. And this has got some great resources in it. I was looking at them today. The IELTS Prepare Hub has about 700 different assets to help you prepare. There are 300 videos, for example. The video of this uh, presentation, for example, will be there and many others. Uh, TikTok uh, advice and animations, uh, 150 articles to read and free practice tests. Uh, uh, you can apply for them there as well. Uh, let's have a quick look at what you can find uh, in the IELTS Prepare. Who's that handsome man there? And uh, 
You can look at that. You can see that there are some paper-based and uh, computer um, assessment um, examples. Uh, we'll give you some idea of what is popularly asked and some of the popular questions and answers. All of those things are there for you. Let's go on. There are some other functions. When you go to this hub, you can choose or focus or filter exactly what you want to find out about. If you're only interested in writing, for example, we can just give you writing information. If you're just interested in a particular type of question or a particular level of IELTS or a particular topic, then we can help you there. Have a look at the sorts of things that you can filter. I would just want videos. I want it academic. Uh, here, I, there are particular uh, topics and also question types. I'm interested in task one and task two, writing, for example. For example, I want to know more about the marking criteria. You can filter your search in that way. Let's go on. Ask IELTS. Now, ask IELTS, there are 100 videos where we will answer questions. And you are invited to submit your Ask IELTS questions via social media, via Facebook and TikTok and other, other uh, ways. And we will answer those questions. The questions will be answered by people like myself, so-called IELTS experts, test takers, test takers as well, ambassadors, and also the managers of test centres. Let's look at some of the material that you will find there. There's Rocco. He's telling you about lots of interesting things. He's talking about true, false, and not given. True, false, or not given. An interesting group of questions, aren't they? Especially the not given response. Um, my advice is to not focus on the not given choice to begin with. Just look at the true or false option first. If the answer is true, then the information in the article matches the sentence. For the answer to be false, it has to contradict the sentence, be opposite or different. In the case of not given, this is your last option, I feel, when you cannot prove if the statement is correct or incorrect. So basically, there's no evidence to say whether it's true or false. Thanks, Rocco. Here is an example of what you will find. Ah, here's another one about pronunciation. Don't forget about the differences in pronunciation between of and of. Of, of, of is spoken with V sound and of with an F. There is a big difference. Good advice. Advice about everything. Got any problems? Go here. We have other online resources, of course. We have the YouTube channel. You can find that uh, when you go to the hub. You can look at the Instagram, uh, our Instagram pages, and you'll find lots of information there. I like Facebook because I'm old. That has a lot of advice. You can ask questions there as well and get answers. And TikTok, of course. There are many resources, so please use them. Some of them are very suitable for you, I'm sure. The next presentation that we have is only a week away, and that will be your IELTS questions answered at the same time. And uh, I hope you tune into that. I certainly will be because it will be full of interesting answers to important questions. So I now am ready to answer your questions, Vincent. And Vincent's there. He's there with his beautiful Dutch background in, all, in all respects. It was made for me. I know. For this location, they gave me the option of different colour schemes. And I was like, give me orange. I love orange. I know. And it suits you too. 
Yeah, I just wanted to touch quickly on one of the comments that you made earlier, Don. Um, yeah. You said, I'm old, so I use Facebook. But you're now there. Like, you're all over Instagram and TikTok, <laughs> all over those channels. I don't use them. I am used on Instagram. You That's are, the difference. are used on Instagram. I'm used, it's clever use of the passive voice. Yeah. For sure. So that's a tip for your speaking test too, right? That's right. Exactly. Um, I do have a couple of questions for you that have been coming in on um, on Facebook live stream and um, in the Q&A. So anyone else, if you have a question for Don, now is your time. Type them into the Q&A and I'll do my best to pass them on to Don and see if we can answer them. So the first question is, I think, relatively simple. Um, or it's an easy question, let's put it that way, not a simple question. Is informal or casual speech acceptable during the speaking test? Uh, that is a good question uh, because a lot of people have different views as to what is casual. Um, remember that the speaking test is a fairly formal occasion. Any test is. There are certain rules and regulations. You're not talking to your friend, even though the examiner is friendly. Having said that, however, there is a degree of informality and casualness, which is quite acceptable in my culture. That's the Australian culture or in America, if you're doing the test there. But in some countries, I know that there is, a, there is a, a tendency to be a little bit more form. Uh, it doesn't really matter. I would suggest a few things. Try not to use very, uh, very, what's the word, vulgar slang words, okay, because you may offend somebody. Um, in, in, with your friends, you can use um, swear words, but don't do that in a test because that would not be appropriate. Um, idioms, and that means using uh, figures of speech, using words and images in a very natural way, some of them are fine in everyday speech, but some of them are not so good. So just be very careful when you use idioms as well. But generally speaking, it's fairly relaxed and you can treat the examiner as a friendly stranger rather than your best friend, okay? Perfect. Um, the next question is probably a little, little tricky, but I'm sure you can manage that too. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about fully addressing a task and sufficiently addressing a task. So this is something that is probably, or someone who's probably looked at the assessment criteria, which is really smart. Um, they want to know a little bit more about, you know, what are those differences? Yes. Well, the assessment criteria, and this person has looked at them, obviously, the assessment criteria makes use of adverbs a lot. Uh, and in English, it's important, uh, sufficiently or fully. Um, partially, uh, sufficiently, uh, fully, uh, uh, not, not um, sufficiently. This is a way of saying one answer cannot be improved. That is fully, fully answering. One answer is uh, a sufficient answer is one that does address the questions and but it could be improved. It could be, something could be added to it. Um, partially is clear. It means that only part of the question has been answered. And you'll see when you look at those assessment criteria that this is what the examiner is looking for. The examiner will say, has each part been addressed? Yes. Could it be improved? Yes. It's sufficient but it's not fully answered. Um, has every part been addressed? No, only part. It's been partially addressed. And the result will be a band five for partially addressed uh, in the writing. A sufficiently addressed will be a band six or seven. Fully addressed will be a band nine. 
And that's my answer, Vinny, and I'm not giving you any more hope. That is, no, but that's, that's a really good start. But, like, I want to I wanna shout out to the person that, I don't know who asked this question, that's a little bit, little bit of a shame, but great work on looking at, the, um, looking at the assessment criteria. So whatever you do, when you're preparing for your test, go there too. Look at what the examiner is looking for. Um, okay, another question. Academic versus general. What is the difference and on what basis should we choose one? Well, that is an excellent question as well. Um, there is really no, uh, there is, when you talk to um, a university, they will say, do the academic because that's for university entry. If you talk to an immigration department, they will probably say, do either. Do whichever one you think is best for you, and they'll accept either score. If you're talking to an employer, depending on the job, they might choose one or the other. Uh, if it's a professional registration, like a doctor or an accountant, they will say academic. In Australia, it may be different in other parts of the world. Um, so that's the first thing. Ask the person who is requesting an IELTS score. If you have a choice, if they say you choose, do either, then you have to think, where are my skills? Now, if you are confident about, and comfortable about reading fairly complicated um, text, then you would do the academic reading because uh, the academic reading, uh, to get a band uh, seven for in the academic reading, you don't have to get so many answers correct as you do in the general training. They are not assessed in exactly the same way. If you have a lot of experience looking at graphs, for example, and tables of figures, maybe you are an accountant and you feel comfortable with those sorts of things, then the academic writing might be very suitable for you. Generally speaking, a lot of people who have the choice choose general training because they believe it is a bit simpler. And it is in some ways, but not in all ways. So you have to think about your own skills before you make a choice, I think. Great. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's also one of the advantages that IELTS offers both academic and general training. So for... Um, for our audience, they have a choice between those two tests. That's but exactly with right. the organization, which tests you need. Um, I have someone, maybe your, your top tip, but they're asking, what, what is a good resource where I can improve my vocabulary? Mm. Well, uh, this is a, a, it, it's an old question because a lot of people say, oh, yes, how do I learn idioms? Is there a book? How do I learn? language that's suitable for a, an academic task too. Is there a good book? Well, there are books out there that will teach you those things. However, I sort of think that it's better to find them for yourself in some ways and to do it systematically, to do it routinely every day and to do it systematically. Um, I'm learning Japanese at the moment, Vinny. I'm terrible at it. But I do have an Excel spreadsheet where I put down the word, in uh, the phrase actually in English and the Japanese and how to pronounce it and how to use it. And I try and revise those things every day. And I am making some progress. So I would recommend every day, do it in a structured way, have a routine and keep your eye out, an idiom for, useful phrases and words. And when you learn a word, try and use it as soon as you can, because the more you use a particular word, the better you'll remember it. And try and learn a word in connection with a group of words. Because in English, it's important when you use a noun to know what preposition goes with that noun or a verb. Um, if you use an adjective, what sort of adverb will go with that? Very is an adverb. Good is an adjective. So the more you're able to connect words together, then the better 
you will improve your um, uh, lexical resource for speaking and also for writing. It is funny that you, should, you, you say that because I do the same on my eye. You can't really see my, my phone here, but I have a list on my phone. Every time I read a book or I come across a very difficult word that I don't really understand the meaning of, I write it down on my list of difficult words in my phone. Yep. I look up the meaning and then I keep looking at that word over and over again. And hopefully over time, I'll improve my, uh, my vocabulary. And, that, and a lot of people will not realise, just listening to you, Vincent, that English is not your first language. I, I, was, yeah, I, was, I, was, I was coming to that because that links um, very well to our next question. Hmm. So the next question is, I am an Indian with an Indian accent, but I'm giving the test in Australia. Is there any way my accent will affect my speaking test score? So I was going to say, oh. I'm Dutch with a Dutch accent, giving my test in Australia. Would that affect my speaking score? Uh, well, you could be from the north of England and your accent uh, would, would be feature in the assessment. This is a true story. Um, accent. Uh, is not something that just belongs to someone from India or France or from uh, the Middle East or Germany or something. It's, <laughs> it's something that occurs within the UK, uh, within the United States. Uh, and sometimes someone from New York may find it difficult to understand someone from um, South Carolina or Texas. Now, these are accents, but the only and there's nothing wrong with accents. They're beautiful. The only problem is if the listener does not understand a particular word. And this means that you need to figure out what words, what, sort, what elements of your accent will affect understanding. Now, if you're from India, uh, you might confuse w and v, for example. Now, most of the time, this probably doesn't affect understanding, but sometimes it might. Um, remember, uh, you need to be someone like Vincent, who is systematic in gathering new words, but also systematic in identifying elements that can be improved. And pronunci pronunciation elements can be improved. And I would suggest that you try and imitate uh, good speakers of English on YouTube or podcasts, imitation, okay? Try that. And finally, can I just say, giving the test, the phrase that was used is not standard English. And this is a question for someone who is from India, because very often I know that English is widespread in India, but it is not always standard English. So be very careful. What you think is a standard use of English may not be standard in the rest of the English speaking world. So be careful about that. We always say taking the test or doing the test. Okay. Perfect. That was a, that was a good tip, for, tip from, uh, from teacher Don. Um, this is an easy one. What is the word limit in writing? The word limit in task one for both academic and general training is 150 words minimum. You might write 160, you might write 170, you might write 200. That's okay. Don't write 300. That's too many words. In task two, academic and general training, the, the required minimum is 250. You might write 260, 270, maybe 300. Don't write 400. Some people, especially some of our Indian friends, think that more is better. I've read some uh, uh, scripts that uh, come from India and they are very long. They're too long. Uh, you can make many more mistakes that way and you don't have time to check your work. So try and aim at about 170 words for task one and about 270 words for task two, and that will be fine.
Fantastic. Um, I love this question too, because it, it does matter, but I'll leave that up to you. Um, for the speaking test, does it matter the dress code in order to achieve, achieve a high score? Um, well, uh, the dress, uh, it goes back to an earlier answer I gave and that the test is a somewhat formal test, right? I'm in the sun here. I'm in beautiful, sunny Warrnambool uh, and it's the, the sun is beaming down in my, well, my office, <laughs> let's call it that. And um, anyway, let me get back to this. Uh, the test is sort of fairly formal uh, and dress codes uh, vary from different parts of the world. Uh, what I'm wearing today is pretty informal. I won't stand up because I don't want to shock any of our viewers, but um, a, 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 an open neck shirt is fine. Um, but really, remember, the examiner is not assessing your clothes. Um, so don't worry about that. You may feel more comfortable uh, dressing more formally, you may feel more comfortable dressing informally. So do what makes you comfortable because the examiner does not assess those things, okay? And that's my answer. That is fantastic. Um, we've, there's a couple of questions about um, the word count and I think you've already answered that. So I'll, um, I'll skip those. Um, just going through a couple more questions. Um, uh, more about writing. So paragraphs are important, but yes. is there a minimum of paragraphs that people should, should use for letters, for example? That's an interesting question. Uh, first thing is letters need paragraphs. Task one, academic needs paragraphs. Task two, academic and general training all need paragraphs. So please use paragraphs. Uh, use full sentences, don't use dot points, don't use subheadings because that will be penalised. And when you ask the number of paragraphs, I would say as a rule of thumb, another idiom, as a general rule, for a task one of 150 words, you might use three or four paragraphs. For a task two, of 250 words, you might use four or five, maybe six paragraphs. Don't use eight paragraphs because that means you'll be making one sentence paragraphs. That's no good. A paragraph should have a topic sentence which is developed in that paragraph. Um, if you have two topics in the one paragraph, one very long paragraph, then that's no good because it should be divided and the reason is, it's not just arbitrary. The reason is it helps the reader. The reader sees the topic of this paragraph and says, okay, he's dealt with that. Now there's a new paragraph. I'm expecting some extra uh, information or a different focus. And I get that. And I'm coming to the conclusion and I'm expecting some sort of summing up. And I get that. So that is what paragraphs are about. It's helping the reader. Perfect. And that also brings us to the conclusion of these Q&As because we're almost out of time. Um, so very well done. You structured that answer really well leading up to the conclusion, <laughs> the conclusion. <laughs> that led to the conclusion of this session. Um, it, was, I, it took me hours to figure that out. To work that out, Vincent. I know, right? Well, you shouldn't have. You shouldn't have said that. You said always leading up to the conclusion of the session. Um, I'm highly, highly intuitive. That's the thing. Fantastic. Look, Don. Um, it was lovely having you um, on this webinar today. I every time you do a webinar, I even learn something from you. So thanks for sharing your insight on everything IELTS. Um, thanks for sharing all the preparation support that is out there. If you want to know more about IELTS, you want to know uh, more about the preparation that we offer, head over to IELTS.idp.com. Um, and if you do forward slash prepare, you get all the preparation materials. It's also where you can book your test. 
Don't forget um, to tune in to our next live webinar on, I think you, you said the 10th of February, right? I think it was something like that. The 10th remember. of February. I'm looking at my chat. One of my colleagues will probably correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the 10th of Feb. Check it out because it's also really interesting for all the questions that you can ask IELTS. So lots and lots of questions that we have here today. Um, the 10th of Feb is correct, says my colleague Sam. Thanks, Sam. Um, but that's it from us. Thanks, Don. Thanks for all your expertise. Um, look forward to the next webinar that we have together. Thanks, Vincent. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Bye.